Okay, any questions before we begin? Nothing? Okay. Okay, this is the last thing that we looked at uh, on Wednesday. Okay, we are st starting to look at the main components of the instruments that we are going to be using for the various uh, analytical techniques. Okay, a, a general block diagram of the main components where the first A will be the main components for measuring absorption. Okay, so if you want to do the analysis and we want to do it based on measurement of absorption where the measurement that we get is absorbance A. Okay, absorption is a process is a thing that happens okay the atom or molecule absorbs a certain amount of energy so that process is an absorption process but the thing the quantity that we measure is absorbance b a n c e okay that's a where a you have, we have seen how it is related to percent t okay Fluorescence and emission can be in the same category because fluorescence, you measure emission, what is being emitted by the atomic species or molecular species. Similarly, in emission also, we measure what is being emitted. So, the quantity that we measure will be emission units, emission. Okay. So, the process and the thing that we measure is the same the process is an emission process and we measure the instead of absorbance it is emission units or if it's fluorescence it's we call it fluorescence intensity where fluorescence is a special kind of emission okay so you better get that straight do not use absorbance and emission interchangeably they are two different things so when you talk about techniques using absorption the measurement is absorbance a when you talk about emission it's emission units so don't don't mix them up and we had looked at the, the main components for the absorption process now if we if I ask you what what is the absorption process what happens in when you met you want to measure how much is absorbed what what must happen Let's say you want to measure how much is absorbed by an atomic species. What is that absorption process? What happens? Yeah. When I mention to you absorb absorption, what comes to your mind? What 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 kind of an idea comes to mind? What do you do? What is being done? You must have light radiation so what happens to that radiation where do you direct the radiation to to your solution to your sample okay and what happens they absorb the light and so some of it is being absorbed some of it goes through so in absorption, what do we measure that day we were saying? PO and P. How much you shine onto the sample, how much got through. Then only you can measure the absorbance. So in understanding the process, then only can you understand, begin to understand what are the main components so you can relate the two. You know, so you must understand absorption process, what happens. So we say just now you need a source of light to shine, to irradiate your sample, to beam onto your sample or solution or whatever. So there we need a source. The light must come from somewhere, it cannot come from the sky, okay? Then you have your sample. Because we say just now we shine onto the sample. Then you must have some way of detecting your percent T. 
you know, your hand your 100% tea, your 0% tea, and then your measurement of your absorbance or percent tea of your sample. You must have some way of measuring PO and P. But you cannot measure light. You, might, you want numbers. So you want to have from the light, from the electromagnetic radiation, you must have some numbers. So you need to process the signal. The signal in terms of light must be converted to something that can be measured electronically the voltage ke, the current or whatever so that's why you need a detector it changes the converts the electromagnetic radiation whether it's PO ke P to some signal to a current which then runs a meter whatever whatever and then you have to process the signal so that you get the absorbance because absorbance is log P over or PO over P so there must be some uh, circuit that does the uh, conversion from uh, one number to the log number so that you get A okay? so you get on your digital display absorbance reading 0, 0.00 something or whatever but one thing that the last thing that we were talking about was with the wavelength selector if you're talking about atomic um, atomic absorption and I want to go back to what we were looking at here the simple energy diagrams for to show absorption and emission where is this thing? this is absorption okay absorption a simplistic way of understanding it so if this is an atomic species the ground state let's say we just talk it jumping from zero to one so for the uh, electron in the atom to become excited, it must absorb this amount of energy, E1. So this E1 must be given by that source. Okay, E1 is related to a certain wavelength, lambda 1. So this lambda 1, light at this wavelength must be given by the source. And that's why we say uh, the, uh, in the quantum... Or we say that the atoms or species exist in quantized states it can only exist here or here or here certain energy levels nothing in between so it cannot jump like halfway you give it half the wavelength and it jumps halfway no it has quantized states that's what these levels refer to that's why we can relate now this wavelength is related to this jump which is related to a certain element because we know that different elements will have different energy levels which is going to be of different energy the difference will be different energy different wavelengths so that's why we need that wavelength selector to make sure that the wavelength incident on your sample is going to be absorbed so you want to make sure if you want to measure absorbance at lambda 1 you must make sure lambda 1 falls on your sample so that's why now we need that wavelength selector whether you're talking about atomic absorption or atomic emission uh, molecular absorption sorry is the diagram here for the molecule yes and similarly for the molecule too the difference between energy levels for the molecule and the atom is the vibrational levels. The electronic energy levels have vibrational levels associated with it. So if you see, if you want to draw energy le level diagrams for a molecule, it must have vibrational levels. So the jump from here to here is still E1, E0, the difference between E0 to E1 is a certain wavelength. But it's just that the wavelength now is not one line, but a band. A band which is centered on the energy between E0 and E1, the lowest vibrational level. But it's got a certain width. Okay? You have some wavelengths above this and some wavelengths below it. But still, the average, the middle, will be difference of this energy, E0 the, between the two black lines. 
because this one the shorter ones will be shorter wavelength if you compare this blue the shortest blue line compared to this black uh, the energy level difference between uh, e0 and e1 this one will be lower energy longer wavelength and the other extreme higher energy shorter wavelength so you have some higher wavelengths some longer wavelengths compared to this this wavelength okay but still you still need to send a certain amount of energy that's why you need that wavelength selector whether you're talking about atomic absorption or atomic emission the atom molecular absorption why am i talking emission all the time similarly when you're talking about emission so that we understand uh, when we look at the block diagram for the emission instrument the instrument that measures emission emission what are you measuring the jump from higher energy level to lower energy level all these blue lines are emission lines they give out energy from the excited state it goes to the ground state and it gives out energy in the form of light a question here can it drop to ground state and not give out light here the atomic species in the excited state or the molecular species in the excited state can it now lose its energy in another form can it give out the energy but not in the form of light how remember all these excited states as the name goes excited you cannot remain excited all the time you have to calm down and lose your extra energy similarly these atomic species and molecular species are also like that excited state is a very unstable state you will drop down to ground state and give out that extra energy but as you say sometimes it gives out in the form of light sometimes it doesn't so when it doesn't give out light how does it lose that energy in what form what could it be heat collisions with other solvent molecules with other molecules surrounding it but it's uh, a solution or a solid thing is not an one atom alone okay you're not talking about one atom here when you want to try to understand what happens yes you talk about you know one electron but i mean it's not just one electron jumping from the lower level to the higher level you're talking about you know millions or whatever electrons that are taking that are involved in the process so we can lose in terms of heat basically like suppose heat or you know a loss of its energy due to collisions between uh, with other species so but in emission we want to measure if the light is given out if the energy is given out in the form of light again we see that emission is also at particular wavelengths uh, this is for sodium that means it will give out light at 590 only or at 330 only and nothing in between nothing from here the middle here to here okay similarly if from uh, emission from uh, a molecular species the same thing these blue lines they refer to particular wavelength lambda 1 lambda 2 so similarly when you measure emission you, you want your detector to look only at certain wavelengths so that's why you also need some kind of a wavelength selector some kind of a filter remember the filter or the colored paper that we were talking about it only allows certain wavelengths to go through and that's what you want you only want to look at certain wavelengths i don't want to look at all the wavelengths i just want to know emission at 590 which is indicative of sodium my sample might contain copper and the copper might also get excited and emit the light but i do not want to measure that copper emission i want only to measure the sodium emission copper would be 3 to 4 so i must have Uh, before my detector for emission i must have some kind of uh, wavelength selector 2 which we will see here in the uh, block diagram for emission so we look at the bottom first and then only we go to the middle in emission you must ha have some way of getting the atomic species or molecular species excited or let's just talk about atomic species here we do not need light we can heat up the sample 
at very high temperatures of course not at room temperature and get that electron excited to higher energy level same same process it jumps up to a higher energy level it becomes excited but the energy it absorbs is not from light it's from heat energy so you get excitation and the black line here shows the light being emitted so again you need some kind of a filter so we'll think of it sim simplistically this wavelength selector is like a filter okay like your filter for your tea or whatnot you know it lets only certain things through and the, the rest it doesn't let through that's that's what a wavelength selector means from the from the name you select your wavelength that you want to pass through and let the detector see only that wavelength okay similarly the detector here same same function you have light falling on the detector and what this blue thing that comes out is a signal in the form of current voltage whatever okay so again which which then has to be processed but here you are not processing your percent T, yeah? no 100% T or 0% T because here we are measuring emission, emission intensity. No, nothing about absorbance here. Okay? So this is the block diagram for your, for your instrument measuring emission intensity, em coming from a, a emission process. And the middle is like a, a fluorescence, it's a special, like I said, a special kind of emission. So here you are still measuring emission intensity, but you call it now fluorescence intensity. Okay, so fluorescence is a kind of emission. The, the difference between fluorescence and emission on the, the bottom here is we excite by using light. We send a particular wavelength to the atomic species or the molecular species and the electron becomes excited. So we need a source of light. Same as we did for absorption okay but here we measure absorb absorption how much passed through how much was absorbed here the sample absorbed light goes down to ground state and gives out light and we measure the amount given out we don't measure the amount absorbed so that's the difference between fluorescence and an absorption an instrument for absorption so you see you need the source sample with two wavelength selectors because you need to send a particular wavelength and also we want to detect only a particular wavelength so you need two filters and your detector and your signal processor and readout okay so this you must know i say a block diagram for an absorption instrument to measure absorbance use in uh, atomic absorption spectroscopy you must know what are the main components of that instrument similarly for emission or for fluorescence so this is basically what is called uh, you know a block diagram of course then you go on to know what are the functions of each of the component any questions know the difference between the three anything now we go into the details you know what kind of sources are used uh, you talk about this wavelength selector is it just as simple as the filter paper the yellow color the, the green color plastic sheet what must the how must the sample be introduced is it in a solution must it be in a gaseous phase detector what kind of detectors are used to measure uv what kind of detectors are used to measure wavelength in the visible region for IR you know because we're talking about different wavelengths in different regions so they will require different kinds of detectors and lastly of course uh, you know uh, signal processing which we we say there are only you know you the simplest one which is a meter the digital display or the interface to the computer so uh, this is just the, the basic components and here is just the, the, uh, you know, the general function. The source, you want a stable source uh, giving out energy of desired wavelength. The sample holder, the wavelength selector that isolates a particular region of the spectrum that you, want, that you are interested in. The 
photoelectric transducer or the detector commonly known as a detector and lastly the, the, the last component of your instrument now as I said we, we, we go into before we go into uh, where are the sources sources is over here maybe we look at the sources first because that's the first component that we want to look at what are the different sources available as we have as we are given here in this table you have sources and you have here the range of your uh, electromagnetic radiation involved in this process in this um, for this techniques that we are going to look at okay so you have your visible like i said roughly between 400 to 700 nanometers below that wavelengths lower than um, 400 means higher energy higher energy photons okay lower wavelength higher energy um, higher frequency you go into the vacuum uh, uv or uv light on the other side of the visible spectrum you have your near ir mid ir far ir whatever okay here longer wavelength shorter frequency lower energy photons so that you have to be very clear about that the relationship between wavelength energy and frequency to understand uh, why is this detector used only for this uv and cannot be used for ir ir why is this source only suitable for ir spectroscopy and not for uv visible okay so if we look at the sources that are available which will give out light in <coughs> this range of um, your wavelengths as we see it's divided into continuum and line and we have already mentioned that the continuum wavelengths have you have you read up on continuum lamps on black body radiation this is what i mean one hour before class one hour after class not a month later before the exam okay i told you to read up on black body radiation so because black body radiation is how these continuum lamps uh, the how it works what is the what what happens in the lamp that makes it give out this uh, the, the range of wavelengths the range of you know light at different wavelengths and we said that examples of continuum lamps like the tungsten lamp uh, which you are familiar with and these which you are not familiar with which we don't use every day tungsten yes hydrogen or deuterium and here i want to show you a well i mean it's just a lamp deuterium lamp okay deuterium lamp so a, a, an example of a continuum source now what what do these blue lines um, how you're supposed to understand these blue lines that are given for under each lamp so if we take the tungsten lamp this blue line represents the light the range of wavelengths which are given out by that lamp so for the tungsten lamp it's going to be bit, uh, from let's say about close to 300 i suppose 280 something maybe approximately to <clears throat> right up to um, close to 3000 nanometers a wide range of wavelengths so that's what you're supposed to understand when you say continuum lamps it gives out many 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 wavelengths okay a large wide range similarly the nurse glower uh, from the uv right up to the ir the nichrome wire also has uh, infrared radiation okay and then we go on to the um, lamps which give out even uh, lower wavelengths like the argon lamp is in the vacuum uv xenon lamp or the hydrogen and deuterium you know it doesn't go into the visible so we are going we will know that when do we require such lamps if we're working with the ir probably is these three the visible is usually the tungsten uv hydrogen deuterium xenon is used in fluorescence because it's high intensity okay 
So all these are continuum wavelengths. We see that you know the line is so long. We talk. We look now at the bottom here. Line spectrum. Uh, sorry, line sources. Line sources related to the fact that it gives line spectrum. Okay, remember the kinds of spectrum: line, band, and continuum. What's the difference? Even be before we go to the hollow cathode lamp here. What's the difference? What you when we say line spectrum? If we were to line versus band. Here is wavelength. Here is Intensity, okay. Intensity of light. What do you understand when you say line spectrum? From the name, the spectrum consists of lines of definite wavelengths. So maybe where this is an example of a LED lamp. This is an example of a line source. You can open it and look it up. Uh, it's called a hollow cathode lamp. It is only for LED, which means that if you turn on that lamp, the light that is given out by that lamp is the emission lines for LED. And I don't remember what the wavelength for LED is, I'm sorry to say. You know, I mean, that means you have some lines. Where these lines are intensity. This is light, huh? light at different wavelengths. So if it's for LED, it must be some ground state of lead, you know, here, giving out light. The ground state, electrons, is already excited when it comes down, it gives this light. This, 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 as an example. That's why it's a line, single line, because atomic species, no vibrational levels, single electronic level. So the line is supposed to be one single wavelength. Of course, that's not true. You know, ideally, yes, that's what it's supposed to be a single line, a single number. So this might be light coming out from that lamp, the line source. But if you were now to take, uh, just to uh, give an example, I suppose the continuum, the deuterium lamp. The continuum lamp that I, I'm passing around, the other one. That one is a continuum. It gives out a wavelength of in a wide range. Can you see the difference? Continuum, very wide range of wavelengths. And continuously, every wavelength, you have light coming out of that deuterium lamp. Of course, in the you see the deuterium lamp is just in the UV region. Okay? Not in the visible. Band something like the line but just broader broader because why is it broader because you have remember the vibrational levels so it's not only one line but several lines the drop from e1 to e0 is actually many many lines but so close together that you cannot see them as a single line they're all lumped together as a band so line spectrum must be from atomic species, band spectrum, must involve some molecule with vibrational levels, and you have your black body radiation. Okay. So here, exam an ex uh, examples of the line spectrum. So sources, now remember, is you're not measuring absorbance. You're me sources mean the source give out light. Give out either line spectrum, band spectrum, or continuum but of course we don't we don't have any band sources we don't we either just have two it's either the continuum source or the line source so here even though the hollow cathode lamps i show it as a line there's no one lamp there's a copper lamp there's a sodium lamp there's a lead lamp there's a rhodium lamp there's a gold lamp okay for particular wavelengths so we call them single element lamps or we also have some multi-elemental lamps 
we have like a sodium, potassium, cesium, all three in one, you know. In a family, you can have like a multi-elemental lamp. And this is one thing that, you know, we laser pointers. Do you know how, what a laser, how a laser works? How you get this light from a so-called laser? What laser stands for? Some of you know, some of you don't. So now it's for you to read up. I'm sure it's in chapter 7 about lasers, please. It's an emission process. I mean, light coming out, it must be an emission process. But what? What is it? What is it about laser that you have to be careful that you're not supposed to shine it into your light, into your eyes? High intensity, very narrow wavelengths. Okay? So in some instruments, yes, you use the, the, the laser. For, for particular purposes and okay we then we go to the other end we have the sources and then we have the detectors to see the different kinds of detectors what is the purpose of the detector at the back here to detect electron janganlah electron detect what to detect wavelength, no. Photons, yes. Photons of radiation at at particular wavelengths, I suppose. So you can you cannot detect wavelength. So make sure you use these terms all very carefully. You do not detect wavelength. You detect light at a certain wavelength, yes. But essentially, you use to de to detect light. So whether it's UV, visible, IR, or whatever. So we see now the different kinds of detectors. Again, these lines represent uh, that this kind of detectors are used for what kind of light. Okay, so we see that here we have one group that is used in the vacuum UV, UV and visible. Based on the photoelectric effect. You have radiation, you must have some electron ejected out. Okay. The, the simple idea behind these detectors is that you know you must have some electron ejected out from some surface uh, when the light impinges on that surface and then you have your semiconductor detectors which most of the instruments now have which you have to do some reading up you have your charge transfer or charge uh, in uh, CID or CCD or whatever now you have the other group here which is used for the IR IR higher wavelength lower energy IR just involves absorption of IR just involves jumps here between vibrational levels only okay when IR is absorbed the jump is only between vibrational levels not electronic transition only change you know it may vibrate here more vibrate here you know just vibration along the bonds in the functional group in the atom in the uh, non atom is it right is are there any vibrations in atom are there vibrational levels for atoms do no there's no bonds Atomic species, single atom, no, no bond for to vibrate along. Okay, so molecular species uh, will have bonds that you can that these vibrations can occur, stretching, whatever you know, some kind of movement between the two, the two, the the two or more. Of course, it's not true. Like hydrogen, you die. Atomic species, no IR absorption. It's not IR active. It does not absorb in the IR. Okay, so. IR involves low energy, high wavelength, low energy. The jump is only this here. No jumping to the higher, higher energy levels. So you need a special detector because you cannot use this detector for to detect IR. Because IR, IR radiation is low energy. Remember how this worked just now we said? the radiation must eject some electron but the energy of the IR radiation is insufficient to kick out that electron 
you cannot use the same kind of detectors in the UV and visible region for IR radiation. Simply not enough energy to kick out that electron because that's the simplest idea of all these of all these detectors used in UV invisible. The UV light uh, or the visible light will eject some electrons, kick out some electrons. Then you get some flow of electrons and current and whatnot. Okay? So IR energy insufficient. So you need some special category of detectors, thermal detectors. Because IR is essentially heat energy. So you, you need some detectors which detect heat energy, low levels of energy. Now we go into the wavelength selector. Okay, so we look at the source, look at the detectors. Now we say those filters, those wavelength um, selectors that we need so that we choose only certain wavelengths. And we will look at um, continuum and discontinuous. On the bottom is the filters simplest kind of wavelength selector which you all understand you have a filter like any filter but now it's just a filter for light you have a certain filter only certain wavelengths come through the rest are blocked okay and we will look into the interference filters and whatnot which are more complicated not as simple as your uh, colored paper colored plastic sheets and then we'll also look at gratings all for the purpose of to select the wavelengths prisms maybe you know about prisms have you handled a prism before yes no prism pernah in physics or to play around with in physics what happens then when you have a prism and you have sunlight on the on the incident on one of the planes a rainbow you get the the white light now being dispersed into the different colors of the rainbow okay so how we use prisms to also serve the same function how to to select a certain wavelength that's what we'll see next uh, after this anyway okay before that in your instrument you will need to have some windows some lenses when you deal with light you want to direct the light to certain direction you need to use lenses or you need to use mirrors okay um, and your prisms has to be made up some of some kind of glass of some kind of material so what is important there is the materials for these windows lenses or prisms they themselves should not be absorbing the light if not you are using your mirror to reflect light in a certain direction but yet the mirror itself will absorb the light so it doesn't serve the function, right? So the lenses, the cells, your sample container should not be absorbing the light that you want the sample to absorb. Here you are, you have something in a, in a container, your sample in a container, and when you shine light on it, you want the sample in the container to absorb the light. But instead, the material of the container is absorbing the light too. So you, your 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 signal is now wrong okay because you did not only measure the absorption of your solution but you also measured the absorption of the container and when you do i don't know whether you've done any absorption measurement at all anywhere lab does start ke? never use a spectrophotometer never not yet okay you'll have some nice clean glass container which you're supposed to dry with uh, lint free paper you know the nowadays everybody is a digital has a digital camera but maybe the lens of you know the front of your camera too you want to clean with tissue paper with something that won't scratch your screen right some lint free camera lens paper similarly actually your container for your absorption, uh, re absorbance readings, uh, measurements should be wiped with such a uh, lens, uh, fine, you know, camera lens paper, so that you don't leave any lint. When you use your tissue paper, you know, your tissue paper, you know, you get all kinds. If you try to dry your glass, you know, you leave lint. That's what it's called, L-I-N-T. All those uh, things from your paper, 
So you don't want that to be left on your glass. You want it to be clean. Plus, you don't want to also have your greasy fingers on those things because your fingers will leave some fingerprint which may absorb in the UV, okay? So you don't want to handle them with your fingers. Even though, I hope you remember that, even though if you're not told by your lab, your lab assistant or lab instructor. So, okay, as we see here, different kinds of materials are available. The top one is lithium floor, and again, the line here, what does it show? This is not a source, huh? So this line is not showing the light, the light given out by this material. Nothing to do with it. These lenses, mirrors, win windows, whatever, do not give out light. So these lines refer to the range. If you use lithium fluoride, means light from this vacuum UV to the mid IR will be transmitted through that material. So if we had lithium fluoride, vacuum will get through. Visible will get through, UV will also get through, near IR and this wavelength. But beyond that, if you send this wavelength through lithium fluoride, it will be absorbed. So this shows the region at which it will transmit with the wavelengths. Okay? So we see that quartz also has a, a wide range of wavelengths that can go through it. However, if we look at corex glass or silicate glass it cannot be used in the uv because if you use if you use silicate glass as your container and you are measuring absorbance in the uv region your container itself will absorb the uv and then we have the ir if we were now measuring absorption in the ir region if you use glass what happens you want to measure absorbance in IR, let's say at 4,000 nanometers. You want to measure absorbance of a molecular species of a particular uh, bond, functional group, at 4,000 nanometers. You now use a glass container, silicate glass, to have your sample in. What happens? Back right there, right at the back. Yes, looking at me. What happens? You understand what I'm asking you? I use a glass, no you ask me, you don't ask your friend, you ask me. You're using a Corex glass container, you put in your sample into this Corex glass. Now I want to measure absorbance in IR, that means I give IR, radiation in the IR region, and I want to measure, I have this detector that measures how much is absorbed. What will happen if I use this Corex glass container? What will happen? Here you see the blue line only in the visible and near IR. Let's say your sample absorbed in 4000. If you send 4000 nanometers to silicate to Corex glass, what happens? What happens to that radiation at 4000? That's what that's how you're supposed to understand this diagram. Don't understand? What will happen? Cannot detect, not using the right words. What will happen to that 4,000 nanometers light? Or IR radiation at 4,000? We're not talking about the, the detector. I'm not even talking about the detector. You are telling me, oh, we cannot detect. We're not talking about the detector. 